So this is just like school. Nobody wants to sit up front. Um, I wanted to start by asking who my audience is. So I'm just curious uh, if there are any of you out here who consider yourselves a part of the food movement or involved in local food policy. Anyone here? Yes? Excellent, excellent. Um, and then I wanted to know if any of you out here work for city governments or participate in politics. And then uh, how many of you here are lawyers who just come to a lot of city club events? <laughs> Almost everybody, okay, um, great. I want to introduce myself. My name is uh, Jean Bouvier. I teach at Case. I've taught there for the past three years. Um, but I became interested in urban agriculture not that long ago, back in 2009, uh, when I was asked to serve on the board of the Lakewood Earth and Food Community. So it's a Lakewood organization where they run a CSA program, community gardens in our public parks, uh, and also do education on a weekly basis. Uh, and before that, I just really wasn't aware of this food thing. I've kind of heard of Michael Pollan, saw some of those documentaries that I'm guessing a lot of you have also either seen or heard about, Food, Inc., those kinds of things, um, but wasn't you know, really that involved. Uh, but once I started working with LEAF, I realized that there was really a thing going on. Um, I now also sit on the board of the New Agrarian Center, so they run the City Fresh program. I don't know if any of you guys know about the City Fresh program, it's a modified CSA program that can actually appeal to people with lower incomes because you only have to pay a week in advance rather than a whole season in advance. Um, and they also run a farm out near Oberlin um, and work on a lot of these projects of trying to uh, you know, grow organically or grow sustainably, um, but also you know, incorporating new technologies into that. Uh, but, so when I began working for LEAF, I should advance, um, I had a friend. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Um, I had a friend named Lynn Rodeman. Let's see, there she is there. Um, who started keeping chickens in her backyard in Lakewood. There we go. Um, and we learned that chickens were illegal in Lakewood. They were actually outlawed as dangerous animals, um, along with sharks <laughs> and alligators, um, which I thought was kind of bizarre. Um, so Lakewood told her that she could not keep her chickens. Um, she had two children that adored the chickens. Um, and so rather than get rid of her chickens, she left Lakewood and moved to Cleveland, which has an ordinance that allows them. Um, and I'm happy to say she now runs a farm off Kinsman called the Urban Egg. Um, and that Lakewood, just I think last week, passed a um, pilot program allowing just 12 families in Lakewood to keep chickens for the next 18 months. So um, that's kind of my background. I started getting into why is this so contentious, the idea of keeping chickens in backyards, and then kind of grew to realize that there was a whole movement going on with backyard chickens across the country. Uh, lots of organizations advocating for them. Lots of organizations advocating for other sorts of backyard animals like goats and bees. Um, I'm gonna call those animals micro livestock, um, just meaning small livestock, things that can fit in a person's backyard. So, um, I've done a lot of research on the micro livestock aspect of this, so I want to say that that's going to be a focus of this talk. Urban agriculture is a huge topic. There's a lot that I could talk about within it. Um, but my focus is really going to be on backyard and front yard gardening um, and keeping backyard chickens, goats, and bees. Um, so as I said, I started to look around and really notice that this was um, a movement that a lot of people, there were a lot of these organizations across the country that were advocating for backyard animals, and that it was a point of friction with city governments. Uh, it was often, t it took an enormous amount of education um, and public rancor um, 
to get these issues passed, and often they did not pass. Um, so I started looking into this. So the first thing I wanted to start with is what's really behind this? Why are so many people now interested in raising chickens, raising bees, raising goats uh, in their backyards? Or why is this whole urban agriculture movement really taken off? So I'm gonna go through a number of things and I'm not here to persuade you about them. I don't have the background to persuade you, um, but I just wanna say that these are concerns that I think are really driving the movement. So the first one is this idea of monocultures, and this really comes from Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. How many people here have read that? Oh, just a few. Um, so in here, he really talks about how we are now, the way that we run agriculture is we grow a lot of the same plant on a vast area of land. Um, and this has ecological consequences um, in that there's really not very much diversity in our farmlands anymore. Um, less and less crop rotation, which leads to depleted soils, but also a real overproduction of corn. We have an enormous amount of corn in this country. Um, and the fact that we have so much corn has led to these CAFOs. Do people here know what CAFOs, CAFOs are? So it stands for Confined Animal Feeding Operation. Um, this is a picture of chickens. I'm not quite sure that you can see that, but you can see that they're kept six to eight to one of these tiny little cages. Um, one of the reasons that this happened is because we have so much corn. It's now become easier to feed these animal corn and keep them in confined spaces rather than just allow them out to pasture. Um, so there's been a lot of issues around these CAFOs um, in that they're inhumane. Um, and they also uh, lead to the use of antibiotics because the animals are kept in such close quarters that they are fed antibiotics just so that they don't get sick, right, in advance, before they get sick. Um, there's also been the issue of a natural animal ha husbandry. So chickens have been bred to grow huge. Uh, um, we like the breasts of chickens, um, and so they have been bred to have very large breasts um, and to grow way faster than they've ever grown before. Um, this has led to chickens who are unable to sustain their own weight, um, so they can't hold themselves up. They're, at a certain point, their own legs will break just because their bodies are too big and their skeletons cannot support that weight. Um, so I think we have a, I have a quote from a, the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. It says, if you grew as fast as a chicken does now, you'd weigh 349 pounds at the age of two. Um, so I also wanna point out that, because uh, we're all lawyers here, three states so far have passed ag-gag laws. So these are laws that keep people from going into these CAFOs and taking pictures or videos. So the, there are some clear First Amendment implications there. Um, so there's also the abuse of workers within the agricultural industry. Uh, and Eric Schlosser, in his book, Fast Food Nation, really talks about um, uh, people who work in slaughterhouses. Uh, I will say I grew up in Iowa, and we had a slaughterhouse in our town. Um, and that, when I was a kid, was a fairly respectable middle-class job. Um, it isn't any longer. It's now a dangerous job, much more dangerous than it used to be, um, and also does not pay. Uh, also, there's some issues of food security. So some people are concerned that with the advent of global warming um, and extreme weather events, and also with the fact that we should be cutting down on the amount of carbon that we're using, in order to stop global warming, we should really be growing more food locally so that we can sustain ourselves with what's grown near us. So I'm put up here the 25% shift. This was a paper written, I think in 2010, locally, um, that showed some of the benefits of creating a local food shed. So that means growing food in the city, growing food in the surrounding suburbs, but also growing food in the surrounding rural areas. So making sure to keep farmland close to cities um, and that if we were to do that, if we were to just 
shift 25% of the food that we eat in the area to food grown in the area, it would have enormous implications economically, good ones, um, and also food security wise. Um, another thing that goes with raising animals in the backyard is nutrition. Uh, backyard eggs from backyard chickens have been shown to have less cholesterol, less saturated fat, more vitamin E, more beta carotene, more omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and there are a lot of reasons behind this. One is that the backyard chickens are less stressed. They are in a more natural sized flock. Um, another is that they have access to sunlight uh, and fresh air, which the chickens within the, the CAFO facilities do not have. Um, they have access to eating bugs uh, and worms, which chickens like to eat. Um, they have access to greens, so grass, bits of vegetable matter, which chickens also like to eat. Um, and interestingly, a lot of people ask me, well, what about organic eggs? And I will say that this actually goes even for uh, the difference between backyard eggs and organic eggs, um, because organic eggs are also mostly raised in, if not CAFO-like conditions, at least indoors, um, with an enormous amount of uh, chickens in one place that don't have access to sunlight or air, or have only unreal access to sunlight or air. So they might have the ability to go outside, but if they don't know that that door leads to the outside, they never go through it. Um, so I also wanted to talk quickly about goat milk. Um, has anyone in here ever tried goat milk? Okay. So a few, a few, and did you get it, I'm guessing, from a grocery store? Did you get your goat, goat milk from a grocery store? <laughs> so I'm seeing some no's, some yeses. I will say I've tried goat milk, and if you get it from a grocery store, it's got a really strong flavor. Um, you can smell it. Uh, but if you, get a, if you get goat milk from a fresh goat, it doesn't have that strong flavor. Um, the issue with goat milk is that it's pretty fragile, so if it's handled roughly or over a few days, it will really get that strong flavor. But if you drink it fresh, it doesn't. Um, goat milk is also um, creamier than cow's milk, and a lot of people say that it's better for humans. It's more like what we should be drinking than what cow milk is. Uh, and there are also issues that some people out there say that uh, it's less allergenic. So people who can't drink cow milk can drink goat's milk. So another issue behind this food movement is one of biodiversity, and especially with the urban agriculture. Um, the commercial stock is mainly made up of just a few breeds, one or two breeds that have been highly bred, as I've said before, in order to uh, get big quickly. And there are lots and lots of other breeds of chickens, of cows, um, of goats out there that are not as widely used. Um, and so there are several organizations de sorry, dedicated to maintaining biodiversity, conserving these other breeds of animals, um, so that if something were to strike our food system, so right now it's actually pretty, there, there are concerns that because the animals um, are so genetically similar within the commercial system, that they could be wiped out fairly easily if there was a disease um, or an infection that really targeted that genetic variant. Um, and so keeping different genetic variants of these animals is important for the future. Um, I want to talk quickly, a special note about urban bees, because there's a bit more uh, urgency with this issue. Uh, bees are necessary to pollinate about a third of our food crops, uh, and having bees nearby uh, will cause neighboring fruit, vegetables, and flowers to have increased and better yields. Um, but as many of you know, there's been uh, an incredible decline in our bee populations. Um, in the past 10 years, in the past 20 years, um, there was an introduction of the Varroa mite, let's see, about 20 years ago, um, which resulted in a steep decline of the bee population. And in the past 10 years, there's been something called colony collapse disorder, um, where bees don't make it uh, through the year. So these are uh, the amount 
of honeybee colonies that have died over the winter um, for the past, what do we have here, uh, over 10 years. Um, and you can see that in the past six or seven years, pretty much 30% of our bee colonies are dying over the winter. So there's been an enormous amount of interest in this. A lot of scientists are looking at this um, and looking at a USDA study. So just so you know, I, I look for reputable sources for this. Um, they think that the problem is uh, some pesticides, so particularly a pesticide called neonicotinoid. Um, the stress of constant travel, so a lot of people who keep bees to pollinate crops will move those hives to different areas over time um, to pollinate those particular crops. Um, and also the lack of plant diversity. So if you remember back, my very first slide was about monocultures. And out in rural areas right now, because we have adopted this monoculture system, we now have huge amounts of areas that have corn or soy and nothing else. Um, and through uh, genetic, genetically modified organisms, so use, using the GMO technology, uh, it's been very effective at getting rid of weeds, for the most part. Um, and so you have vast areas with just that plant and nothing else. So they used to, you know, bees used to be able to find other plants in the middle or things, you know, would kind of grow amongst the crops, but no longer. Um, and so you have a real lack of genetic diversity out in rural areas. So um, there, has, there have been several scientists that have said keeping bees in the city is a really great idea because there's actually more plant diversity, if you believe it or not, here than there is out in the rural areas. Um, and so we really need to be looking at our city land policies to be allowing for beekeeping because the more people we can get to keep bees in the city, the better chances we have for keeping an extant bee population and being able to pollinate a third of our food crops. Um, another issue behind the food movement, I think, is this issue of building community that we're really feeling very apart from each other. And I will say, once I started joining these organizations, I realized there was a whole bunch of community around this, community of joining the community gardens, seeing my neighbors um, on a weekly basis that way, the community of these education, um, workshops that we would hold, the community of the CSA program and the farmers markets itself, the fact that I was seeing my neighbors, my friends, you know, once a week. Um, and, and that is something that, you know, has been found across the country within these, uh, within these organizations and within this food movement. I also want to say that um, most cities of any size have an organization for backyard chicken keeping, backyard beekeeping, um, that is there either to advocate for it or to support people who have it. Um, and so they have uh, chicken coop tours. Has anyone here ever been on a chicken coop tour? This is a common thing across the country. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and the classes that go with that and the support, you know, lots of uh, meeting groups, lots of online resources. Um, but I want to say that I think the biggest reason behind this food movement is a more spiritual one. Um, and so to get at that, I'm going to give you a few quotes from some of the pictures that I have up here. So uh, first, Michael Pollan, who I think is a um, big you know, leader within the food movement, uh, has written, what is attracting so many people to the movement today, and young people in particular, is a much less conventional kind of politics, one that is about something more than food. The food movement is also about community, identity, pleasure, and most notably about carving out a new social and economic space removed from the influence of big corporations on one side and the government on the other. Uh, I also want to give you guys the Slow Food Manifesto. So has, who here has heard of the Slow Food Movement? So a lot of people here have heard of Slow Food. Um, so here's their manifesto. Uh, our century, which began and has developed under the insignia of industrial civilization, first invented the machine and then took it as its life model. We are enslaved by speed and have all succumbed to the same insidious virus, fast life, which disrupts our habits, pervades the privacy of our homes, and forces us to eat fast food. 
A firm defense of quiet material pleasure is the only way to oppose the universal folly of fast life. Our defense should begin at the table with slow food. Let us rediscover the flavors and savors of regional cooking and banish the degrading effects of fast food. In the name of productivity, fast life has changed our way of being and threatens our environments and our landscapes. So slow food is now the only truly progressive answer. Alice Waters here, who is a, a chef and also a leader within the food movement, um, has said, food is the center of a wheel with all these spokes going out. So it's just a mystery why politics are not really all about food policy. And of course, I see it as a center of politics. I think when you make the right decisions about what you are going to eat, you make the right decisions about everything that you are doing in your life. It's a place where you can find meaning in your life. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about Wendell Berry. Um, he asserted that gardens are a protest of the conventional food system because they signal a symbolic independence from it. Um, he said, some people will object at this point that it belittles the idea of gardening to think of it as an act of opposition or protest. I agree. That is exactly my point. Gardening, or the best kind of gardening, is a complete action. It is so effective a protest because it is so much more than a protest. So we have this food movement. Uh, describe some of the things that are going on behind it. So how are cities reacting to this? Um, in some really great ways. So I want to applaud. I, I, I am not one of the big experts on what Cleveland is doing. There may be people here that know more about it than I do. But Cleveland has been a real leader within the urban agriculture movement and within the food movement. Um, they have a garden zoning district to allow for community gardens. They passed a micro livestock ordinance back in 2010, uh, which allows for chickens and bees and also allows for larger livestock on larger plots of land within Cleveland. Uh, and one of the really special things that Cleveland has done in this area has they've thought about not only backyard farmers, but they've thought about um, market gardeners and, and commercial farmers within Cleveland and how to set aside land for that and how to regulate that. Um, a lot of cities are only really looking at backyard animals and not thinking uh, with such a, a larger view um, of what can happen within the food movement. Um, they've also allowed agriculture and residential districts so that you can grow food on plots that are not connected to a dwelling and also sell food. Um, from plots that are connected to a dwelling that then doesn't make it commercial. Um, they also have this wonderful gardening for greenbacks program where they're actually paying people who take land to use for market gardens and urban farms. Um, and they've created this new urban agriculture innovation zone down in the Kinsman neighborhoods where there is a number um, of urban farms that are kind of close in proximity to each other. Um, and we have a really, a, a lot of really wonderful urban farming going on here. And we really have been an example to a lot of cities uh, across the country. So Cleveland has been doing some really great things. Um, there are a lot of other cities who have passed comprehensive micro livestock ordinances uh, in the past few years. And when I say comprehensive micro livestock ordinances, I mean that they are not just allowing for backyard chickens, but they've thought about different sorts of animals that can easily be raised in a backyard um, and have gone about setting regulations for how that can happen. Um, so these are just a few of those cities. But I will say I've looked at these codes. Part of what I like to do is you know, kind of figure out what the norms are uh, around these regulations. Um, and uh, I will say that the norms here that are developing are that over time, these regulations become less burdensome uh, when they look around and realize that it hasn't really caused problems in other cities, like people are afraid that it will. Um, and that they uh, limit the kinds of animals and the number that can be caught, that can be kept. Um, so these all allow somewhere between two and three goats, six and eight chickens, sometimes more, um, and two to five beehives. Um, they usually have setbacks so that things need to be kept either far, uh, a certain distance, somewhere between 10 and 20 feet from the neighbor's residence, 
for a certain distance, somewhere between five and 15 feet for these ones, um, from uh, side yard lines and backyard lines. Um, they usually also require a certain amount of space per animal. So you have to have a certain size of yard to keep however many animals, usually you know, a little bit more space, the more animals that you're keeping. Um, they also usually require some kind of standard of cleanliness. Things need to be kept clean. Um, food needs to be kept you know, covered. Um, and they finally, they almost all restrict male animals. So no roosters, no bucks. Uh, chickens and bees, this is a very short list, um, are very common. A lot of cities are now allowing uh, for both chickens and bees, but not necessarily in a comprehensive way. They've had some chicken uh, advocates come and talk to them and over time passed backyard chicken ordinances um, and had bee advocates come and talk to them and over time passed backyard bee ordinances. Um, a lot of cities don't, have never uh, made bees illegal. Uh, chickens have been made illegal as part of livestock, but bees, because they don't fit our definition of livestock, are not illegal in, in just a lot of places. Um, so there's been a lot of studies over major cities that allow backyard chickens, and it's really grown. You can see from the numbers here. Um, one study done in 2006 said 65% of cities allowed for backyard chickens, large cities. Uh, I did a study in 2010 showing 85% of the 100 most popular cities allowed for backyard chickens. Um, and a study was done in 2012 showing 93% of major cities allowed for backyard chickens. Um, I am not sure. I don't really understand how those studies on the outside were done, the 65% and the 93%, because I didn't do them. But I can vouch for the 85% number in 2010. Um, so if we've had such a growth, in urban agriculture, we've had such a growth in these backyard animals. Why is it still so controversial? Um, and I will say it is controversial. I will also say that I think a lot of major cities have now passed these ordinances, and the fight has really moved into the suburbs. Uh, and I think it is actually more controversial in the suburbs. But if, if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, because the major cities generally are you know, they, they have a lot more people in a lot smaller area. Um, and the suburbs actually have some room for this kind of stuff. You get the yard, uh, you get the space to do it in. But yet the suburbs uh, have been very much uh, against this. It's, it's changing, but um, it seems to be much more contentious there. So I think that's what's going on is something different than these commonly heard complaints. But I want to go through them quickly, just to talk about what normally comes up in these sorts of discussions when uh, people are advocating for backyard animals. Um, so, so these are the things that we hear about all the time, odor, noise, and disease. So I want to work my way through them to really prove that they are not actual real problems within this backyard livestock movement. So uh, overall, the argument is going to be that these animals don't cause any more nuisance than your typical cat or dog. Um, but yet we put up with cats and dogs, but we somehow find chickens or goats or bees to be something that we can't, you know, we, we need to be keeping out. So as for odor, uh, four chickens have the same output uh, as a medium-sized dog. Um, and chicken and goat manure, if cleaned regularly, like you should clean out your yard if you have a dog, um, isn't all that stinky, especially if you keep it to these small flocks, six to eight, maybe up to 12. Um, and also does and weathers, so this is female goats uh, and male goats that have been neutered, they don't stink. But male goats in the rutting season, um, they do. So that's where that gamey kind of goaty odor that you associate with goats, that's a male buck. Uh, during rutting season. As for noise, um, hens at their loudest, you can see, are at the same level as just a quiet human conversation. Uh, hens do not cluck all day. They tend to cluck, um, they tend to cluck when they're laying an egg. 
Uh, but other than that, they're just, they're not all that noisy. Uh, I do want to take a little time out and say that there have always been chickens, backyard chickens, in most cities. Um, most, there, there is an enormous amount of people who are keeping these, regardless of whether or not they are legal, and have done so for decades. Um, most of us just don't know about it because they're not a big problem. Um, you don't hear them, you don't smell them. Roosters, however, are noisy. Uh, roosters do like to crow, um, but here's a common myth. Um, hens don't need roosters. You don't need to have a rooster around to have hens lay eggs. Uh, so you can just ban the rooster, keep the hens. Um, diseases uh, is a big one that we hear about. Um, the biggest one that we hear about is avian flu. There's a real concern uh, about backyard chickens and avian flu. Uh, with, again, if you think about it, it doesn't make much sense. Um, the University of Iowa, the USDA, a lot of big organizations have looked into this. And the best place for the avian flu to really come out of is the CAFO kind of organization, or, uh, CAFO way of raising animals, because you have a lot of animals in a very small space um, that are not terribly healthy. Um, and so those are really good conditions for a new virus to come up in and spread rapidly. Um, and you know, those are the kind of conditions that would be probably textbook best to be uh, creating the avian flu. Um, so if you think about it, the backyard chickens are actually probably a way around that happening. Uh, another disease that comes up is salmonella. Um, yes, chickens do have the ability to get salmonella and pass it on, but a little known fact, so do dogs. They can also get salmonella and pass it on, so do turtles. Um, these are pets that we allow. Um, the CDC and the USDA have looked into this, and they don't think that the possibility of these diseases are any reason to ban backyard chickens, um, nor do public health experts. They just advocate for people to wash their hands. Uh, after touching a chicken or other backyard animal. Um, predators is another issue that comes up. There is some fear that once you put the chicken in, we're gonna be attracting all these predators into the city. Um, that fear is unfounded. Chickens do attract predators. Predators do like to eat chickens, uh, coyotes, uh, skunks, chicken hawks. Um, but those predators were already here. Uh, they are in our cities already. Um, and a lot of regulations uh, ask for people who have chickens to create predator-proof cages. And within the backyard chicken movement, within all that support, there's a lot of information how to create cages that can keep these predators out. Um, there's another issue with slaughter. Um, people are very concerned about possibly witnessing a slaughter of a chicken in a backyard. There's easier ways around that. Um, you can either outlaw slaughter altogether, which a lot of cities do, or require it to be out of the way so that other people can't see it, or you know, accept that part of raising the chickens is to also eat them and allow for it. Uh, a lot of people are concerned with winter weather. What are these poor chickens gonna do in the winter? Um, there are lots of breeds of, you know, we've, we've kept chickens for a long time and we've kept them in winter areas. And there are a lot of breeds that have been bred um, to withstand winter weather. So, you know, there are, there are ways that you can take care of your chickens even through this cold snap, like the one that we're in now. Um, running wild is also an issue that comes up uh, again and again. Um, and I've looked at an enormous amount of ordinances in cities across the country, and what's really funny is even in those cities that outlaw chickens, they have um, ordinances against chickens running wild. So it's kind of left over. They never took out of their code. Um, same with the predator-proof cages. This can be regulated. Just you know, make sure that the, ki the chickens are kept um, within a fenced-in area or within a cage. Um, it really should not be that large of a problem. Another thing that comes up a lot is there's going to be so many complaints. The neighbors are going to be complaining, really going back to the odor, noise, and other things uh, that just haven't been a problem. Um, this is a quote from Denver, who just passed a uh, sort of comprehensive micro livestock ordinance allowing for chickens, goats, and bees. Um, he says there was a big perception that we were in for it, um, but it's been very min 
complaints, but it's been very minimal. It's a non-issue, really. I will say that I haven't been able to publish it because I can't get it up to the standards I would like. Um, but I have personally called about 20 cities that have recently passed either backyard chicken ordinances or these comprehensive ordinances to ask how many complaints that they've gotten. That they've gotten. Um, and they don't get complaints. Usually they get a few complaints after it passes from people who are upset that we've allowed, you know, that that particular city has allowed backyard animals at all. Um, but they don't get complaints about actual people keeping backyard animals, just a few. And same in Cleveland, very few complaints. Um, and in comparison to dogs or cats, minimal. Um, so it's just really not been an issue. So this is the last one I want to talk about, property values. This one comes up again and again. So once you say, hey, you know, there's no, there's this odor noise disease, there's, it's really not a problem, there's really not been a lot of complaints, people come back to property values. Um, there hasn't been any study to show whether or not this affects property values either way, um, but there are studies in general that say uh, if you have more permissive regulations, property values tend to go up because you attract people to that area that are able to do the thing that they want to do. Um, but I, I want to keep a hold of this because it's one that continues to come up even after you've solved all the other issues or said, hey, those aren't really a problem. So if these common concerns are actually something that we can get around pretty easily just through some you know, basic regulation um, or they were myths to begin with, why is it still so controversial? This is a thing that I've been really thinking about for a long time. Why does this cause so much controversy? Um, here are some local controversies. I've been looking at this across the country, but here are you know, some cities that have found it to be legal. Um, but it's been very controversial, and Lakewood, we've been trying to pass backyard chickens for, I think, six years now. Um, we've just got the pilot ordinance through, but it's restricted to 12 families. Euclid also. Uh, I believe in trying to pass for a while. They also have a pilot ordinances, a pilot ordinance restricted to just a few families. Uh, South Euclid and Broadview Heights, there have been some ongoing controversies for years. Um, these are quotes from public officials. So we are trying to look to the future. You can't raise animals or livestock in the city. All things considered, I think chickens should be raised on a farm. Uh, this one here and the third one is from Mary Louise Madigan in Lakewood. Uh, it's an experiment. It's an introduction to barnyard animals into our city of 52,100 people. Uh, and then this is my favorite one, because it's so true. Um, there is a lot of anger around this issue for some reason, more so than the war by far. Um, which, if you think about it, is kind of ridiculous. Why is there so much anger? Why is there so much controversy here? Um, and if you notice, none of these are about odor, noise, and disease. They're all just about the concept of having barnyard animals in a city. Just they don't belong. Um, so I want to get back and see where is this coming from? Because the common perception is back, you know, we must have gotten animals out of the city for a reason. There must have been a good reason why we did it uh, back in the 1920s and 30s. Um, it must have been a problem with it. So let's go back and look. Um, this is a picture of Seattle in 1874. And through the 19th century, animals were kept in cities, in the rural areas, right outside of cities. Um, they were part of city life. Up through 1905, um, we have a picture here of a small dairy in a very populated area. Um, I'm using Seattle because uh, Fred Brown wrote a dissertation on animals in the city, so I can get some good information from him. This kind of information is not easy to find. Um, up through the 1920s and into the 30s even, keeping backyard chickens was considered a fad. It was a craze. It was in very common um, in city urban neighborhoods, dense urban neighborhoods. Um, this is a USDA poster from 1918 uh, advocating that every, every family has enough room to keep a few chickens and how wonderful this is for food security. Um, this is an article, uh, let's see, I can't read it. I think it's from Tennessee, um, educating people on how to keep backyard chickens on small urban lots. Um, so it was a thing, it was, it was very common. 
so what happens? Why did we start eliminating chickens and other animals that could fit within urban spaces from cities? Um, and I argue it was really the rise of the subdivision and the restrictive covenant um, in the 1910s, even starting in the, in the late 19th century. Um, these suburbs with restrictive covenants started, and they were really aimed at the wealthy. Um, and they were aimed to provide a community where there were only the wealthy. Um, in one of these first subdivisions built by the Olmsted brothers, they banned all animals, dogs and also livestock, um, because animals can't easily be controlled, right? They run into other people's yards, even dogs bark. We know that that can be a problem. Um, so they wanted to keep all animals out to have this very uh, separate, rich community. Um, this is the original Shaker Heights deed restriction. So this comes from, you know, very close to us. Um, in Shaker Heights, they um, restricted any kind of vegetable garden. So the planting of trees or shrubbery, the growing of flowers or ornamental plants or for statuary, fountains and similar ornamentations for the purpose of beautifying said premises, but no vegetables, so-called nor grains of the ordinary garden or field variety shall be grown thereon. Um, this is a typical sort of subdivision deed restriction. Um, no poultry, cattle, livestock, except watchdogs and family pets, and driving horses shall be kept. Uh, and I'm going to skip to the last one. No Negroes or persons of Negro extraction, except while employed thereon as servants, shall occupy any of the land. So you often saw these things side by side. No livestock, no vegetable gardens, um, you know, no Negroes, no Jews. We're going to keep all that out of our nice suburb that we're creating. Um, there was a study done in 1928 that looked at a lot of these restrictive covenants. These were the top five things that were kept out of these subdivisions. So I would ask, what is it about those that are being kept out? Um, and I will say that it's really this difference between productive and non-productive animals, um, or productive and non-productive uses of land. So these subdivisions were really about attracting the wealthy. And so they, they were attuned to ideas of status. Um, and they were attuned to the fact that if you have a cat or dog, it actually costs money to keep it. It is a family pet. Um, Non-productive uses of your yard costs money to keep. It's sort of conspicuous consumerism, right? Um, but chickens, goats, cows, they actually were a form of income. Um, and were used that way. And they also helped with food security, right? You could help it to supplement your food budget or get food from your, from your own yard. So they wanted to keep those productive uses of land out, keep out people who use their land in a productive way because they were really trying to keep it just for the wealthy. I will also say that there was um, a gender aspect to this. Um, animal keeping has always, or in the United States at least, was always done by the women. Um, keeping a few backyard animals, a few chickens, the, the small dairies that were done, were almost entirely by women or by minority communities, by African Americans. Um, and so to have backyard animals or to have this backyard vegetable garden was a way for women to have extra income. It was one of the few ways of making money that was actually open to women back at that time. Um, so in these subdivisions, you could show off, my woman does not need to work, um, as opposed to women who could make extra money that way. Um, and also there was the rise of consumerism, right? So it was, became much more easy to get stuff from a grocery store. Um, and that this was also definitely an aspect of that that to grow food yourself was seen as low class. So I, I want to talk again about sort of that this has created these, I say, competing narratives. Um, and not necessarily competing them, but that, that there have been these two narratives of farming sort of threading back through our history. 
So I call it the prosaic narrative. Um, farming is really associated with being low class, um, with subsistence, with drudgery, with poverty. Um, but we also have, and have always had, this romantic view of farming, um, that it's self-sufficiency, it's about responsibility, it's about being close to nature. Um, so now you can see that we are now 80% or more urbanized. Um, so uh, you can see here that it was like 40% of the population in 1920 to 60% of the population in 1950 to more than uh, 80% today. So the majority of us have no direct relation with farming. We are either relying on what we've heard from our parents or what we've heard from our grandparents. Um, and so I go back to, while people really think that we eliminated small-scale farming because it was a nuisance, this really wasn't what was going on. What's happening now, I propose, is that we're acting on those prejudices from the 1920s, the 1930s, 1940s, that were largely based on segregating out the poor, keeping out people who were using backyard gardens as a form of subsistence, um, keeping whites away from other races, showing others that your wife didn't need to work, um, and that embracing of the role of consumer. Um, and I contend that that is why this is so contentious. This is really about those competing narratives um, of what our view of farming is, not based on actual experience, but based on sort of leftover, I would say, zombie prejudices that we haven't really thought about very deeply. Um, so I want to end by saying, within the food movement, this, these prejudices don't make sense anymore. Um, the people who are interested in backyard farming are for the most part young, for the most part college educated, and for the most part middle class. So I'm taking this particular picture I put up here of two smiling ladies uh, holding chickens. Um, it was from a CNN Money article talking about the rise um, in backyard chickens and the fact that it was really associated with uh, middle class and even upper middle class um, people. Um, and that these two women are making uh, money doing a chicken babysitting service uh, within their community. So I guess my, my point is that those prejudices, one, were never right. Those aren't things that we really should be acting on. But two, they don't make any sense. It's not about what the 